Today's story is from the Mahabharat. It's about a palace of illusions, hurt feelings, a high-stakes game of chance played with loaded dice, and Yudhishthir's weakness for gambling. Namaskar and welcome to Stories from India. This is a podcast that will take you on a journey through the rich mythology, folklore and history of the Indian subcontinent. I am Narad Muni, the celestial storyteller and the original time lord. With my ability to travel through space and time, I can bring you fascinating stories from the past, the present and the future. From the epic tales of the Mahabharat and Ramayan to the folk tales of the Panchatantra, to stories of Akbar Birbal and Tanali Raman, I have a story for every occasion. The purpose of the stories is neither to pass judgment nor to indoctrinate. My goal is only to share these stories with people who may not have heard them before and to make them more entertaining for those who have. In this episode, we are back to the main storyline of the Mahabharat. If you haven't binged the previous Mahabharat episodes, I welcome you to check out the links in the show notes and on the site sfipodcast.com. Regardless, I'll recap the story so far. The Mahabharat is one of two major epics from India. The other is the Ramayana, which we have also covered here. on the show the mahabharat kicked off with bhishma who was the crown prince of hastinapur bhishma gave up the throne so that his father could play the geriatric romeo the price bhishma paid for his father's romance was a promise that bhishma would himself never sit on the throne he would never have children and always serve whoever did sit on the throne bhishma did his best but tragedy after tragedy struck the family every king who ascended to the throne seemed to quickly slide off of it as well as if the space around the throne was littered with banana peels maybe it actually was There were so many kings it's actually possible one of them did slip on a literal banana peel After much confusion and turmoil Dhritarashtra became king Despite being blind he was the only possible emperor candidate in his generation And now Dhritarashtra was getting old as well So you might think it's a good thing that he had a hundred plus children each physically able to handle the responsibilities of ruling an empire but it was not so simple Duryodhan was the oldest of Dhritarashtra's children but he was younger than Yudhishthir the eldest of five boys of the previous emperor Pandu Yudhishthir was certainly considered a much more sensible candidate to succeed Dhritarashtra. This public opinion nudged the emperor into naming Yudhishthir his crown prince, much to Duryodhan's chagrin. Duryodhan responded by inviting the Pandavas and their mother Kunti to a barbecue with themselves on the menu. Unbeknownst to Duryodhan and the almost hundred Kaurav brothers, the Pandavas and Kunti escaped. Rather than confronting Duryodhan's dastardly deed, they decided to go on a countryside jaunt, incognito. Along the way, Bhim, the second oldest Pandav, married a demoness and had a child with her. Arjun outdid Bhim. He found a bride not only for himself but for each of his brothers as well. Unfortunately, 
there was really just one bride across all five brothers. That was because of a ridiculous mix-up worthy of a modern-day sitcom. Dhritarashtra and all the other Kauravs realized that the Pandavs were still alive. They summoned the brothers and Kunti back to Hastinapur. Duryodhan had already been made crown prince and there was no chance of Yudhishthir getting his hands on the royal headgear. Duryodhan had his name engraved on it already. Coins and banknotes and posters were all updated. Dhritarashtra, Duryodhan and Duryodhan's uncle Shakuni gave the Pandavs a piece of land as a compromise. This land was a very dense and inhospitable forest. Through hard work, a bit of help from Krishna and the god of fire himself, Arjun cleared that forest. From that forest emerged Mayasur, the demon architect who was responsible for incredible creations including the golden city of Lanka. In exchange for sparing his life, Mayasur promised to construct a massive palace, the likes of which no one had ever seen before. Now, Yudhishthir stood in front of the Maya Sabha and remarked, Oh wow! Look at this palace! It's massive! The likes of which no one has ever seen before. He was not the only one impressed by the Maya Sabha. Arjun was gushing over the fact that he had his own private archery range within his chambers. Nakul and Sahadev had large enough rooms that they would need a horse to get from one side to the other. And that was fine because their chambers had stables. Mayasur had thought of everything. Bhim had an idea and he elbowed Yudhishthir in the ribs and said, You know, bro, how you were saying just yesterday that our little kingdom needs a revenue source? We can use the ring in my chambers. We can stage prime time wrestling matches there and people will pay to see folks fight. We can charge for admissions and the pay-per-view television rights will rake in a bunch of money as well. And it won't cost us a thing. We can choreograph the fights. People will still believe it's all real. It was a solid idea. But Yudhishthir had bigger things on his mind. Before we do dull things like earning money, we need to express our gratitude, he said. Eh? Beam exclaimed. Then he added, Gratitude? To the gods, you mean? No, brothers, Yudhishthir replied. To Duryodhan and Uncle Dhritarashtra. If they hadn't sent us here to the forest, we wouldn't have had to clear it. And then we wouldn't have found Mayasur. And he wouldn't have made this amazing palace for us. Arjun should have objected at this point. He had done all the real work of clearing this forest and sparing Mayasur's life and all that. He did object just now, but not about that. Are you seriously thinking that Duryodhan was being altruistic here by giving us this forest? But Yudhishthir was keen to play this by the book. Ill will towards his cousins would get their new kingdom off to a bad start. He said they should be thankful and simply live and let live. But Arjun, Bhim, Draupadi, Nakul and Sahadev all pointed out that Duryodhan certainly wanted to live and let die, judging by the assassination attempt at Lakshagraha. But Yudhishthir just wouldn't listen. 
he dashed off a letter to Duryodhan dripping with kindness and gratitude and inviting him to visit Maya Sabha. The other Pandavas may have feared that Duryodhan would read this letter and think that the Pandavas were groveling. But they need not have feared. Duryodhan was overcome with a stronger emotion. Jealousy. And that was because he saw the Insta paintings that Yudhishthir had enclosed. Duryodhan couldn't sit idly by and do nothing. He had to see the palace in person. If it was inferior, he could gloat about it. But if it wasn't, he had to know. And so it was that Crown Prince Duryodhan visited the Pandavas in their new city of Indraprastha. Some called it New Delhi, but that name hadn't stuck yet. Duryodhan had to keep his jaw in check to avoid giving away how impressed he was. The palace was truly marvellous and the true extent of the palace's size and luxury became clear the moment his carriage pulled into the marble courtyard. The valet opened the door for him and swapped the keys to the carriage for a gold-plated ticket and took off with the carriage to the parking area. An attendant came up to Duryodhan with a hot towel, while another served an ice-cold lassi in a tall glass with a cute little umbrella in it. She also handed the crown prince a map to the palace so he wouldn't get lost. Duryodhan began his tour of the palace. A few hours later, he was impressed by the indoor water slides, the home theatre system, the majestic courtroom, the war rooms, the arsenal, the cricket field. But his favourite was the sweets bar. The gulab jamuns and rasgullas there had been heavenly. His only regret was that he hadn't eaten enough. But that had been difficult. Bhim had been at the same sweets bar, and that made it awkward for Duryodhan to pig out. Duryodhan eagerly grabbed another glass of lassi that the hostess offered him. Your Highness, how did you like the A-wing? The A-wing? Duryodhan was stunned. You mean there are more? Indeed, there are several. The first few are named after the letters of the alphabet. Then, we ran out of letters, so we switched to numbers. This was too much for Duryodhan. Such opulence was unheard of, even in the mighty empire of Hastinapur. How had the Pandavas achieved so much in such little time? The hostess invited Duryodhan to step in this direction to the rest area if he wanted a break before continuing his tour to the next wing. What? Here? Into this pond? Duryodhan asked. She had clearly indicated a room that was an indoor swimming pool. It was filled with water. Was she trying to trick him? And now that he saw the Pandav brothers strolling by, he was confident that that was what it was. They wanted him to fall in the water so that they could laugh at him. But the hostess shocked Duryodhan by walking directly into the swimming pool. She did not fall in. The floor had to be solid. But Duryodhan didn't understand it. He could see his reflection in it. And it looked exactly like water. 
even PC Sarkar couldn't have managed an illusion of this caliber. Duryodhan chuckled nervously and stepped forward. And to his enormous relief, he didn't fall in either. This was a truly marvelous design. Duryodhan decided that he had to have this palace for himself. He strolled into the next room and he saw it was just like this one. It was also made up to look like a pool. Confidently, he strolled forward. The hostess shouted a warning, but it was too late. There was a loud splash as Duryodhan fell into the water. This room wasn't made up to look like water. It was water. The hostess and Yudhishthir were the only ones who rushed to help Duryodhan out. The other Pandavas were rolling on the floor, laughing. They were rolling on the solid floor, not the watery one. There was just one thought running through Duryodhan's mind as he headed back to Hastinapur. He absolutely had to have Indraprasth for himself. And he had to humiliate the Pandavas. He was convinced that they had deliberately set him up for this. He would take over Indraprasth and the Maya Sabha. And then he would sit back eating rasgullas from the sweets bar and ordering his men to dunk the Pandavas into the swimming pool. When Duryodhan got back, Shakuni Mama was there to receive him. And straight away, he could see the lines of worry on his nephew's face. Shakuni heard everything and said not to worry. He had the solution well in hand. Duryodhan looked curiously. Shakuni Mama, all you have in your hand are a pair of dice. And that, my dear nephew, is our solution. Duryodhan didn't understand, so Shakuni explained that Duryodhan was going to invite the Pandavas to board game night. This annoyed Duryodhan. They humiliated me, and now you want me to play ball with the Pandavas? Not ball, dice, Shakuni corrected. This made no sense to the crown prince, so Shakuni said, I'll show you what I mean, Duryodhan. Pick a number. 19,674, Duryodhan replied. A number between 2 and 12, Shakuni clarified. Duryodhan said 6. Shakuni rolled the dice and they came up to 6. 6 was easy. Do 12 now. Shakuni rolled the dice again and they showed 12. Okay, that was just a coincidence. Now, I want 2. Shakuni rolled a two and said with more than a touch of pride, God doesn't roll dice. I do. And I do it to win. You're on a roll, Shakuni Mama. You know, with your talents, we should visit a casino. Duryodhan said, We'll make a pile of money. Then we can hire our own architect to make a bigger palace than Maya Sabha. And then we'll see who has the last laugh. Shakuni shook his head. Why bother with all that? Just invite the Pandavas to a game of Ludo. Yudhishthir has a bit of an addiction for games of chance. You were telling me how he lost everything at the carnival that you went to. The carnival? that came to town back when we were in Dronacharya University? Sure, but that was long ago. 
I'm not sure Yudhishthir is still much of a gambling man. We'll see soon enough, won't we? Write to him tonight. Don't delay, Shakuni instructed. Let's cut back to Indraprastha a few days later when Yudhishthir was reading aloud Duryodhan's letter to his brothers. Congratulations! You have been entered into the Inter-Kingdom Ludo Championships. The winner will receive a grand prize beyond their imagination and a lifetime supply of laddus from Nathu's Mithaiwala. The finals will take place at Hastinapur Ludo Arena next Tuesday, 7 p.m. sharp. Be there or be square. It's a trap, Draupadi, Arjun, Nakul, Sahadev all said immediately. Bhim may have been a little tempted by the offer of a lifetime supply of Nathu's laddus. But despite that, he thought the situation felt a little dicey. But Yudhishthir, ever the gentleman, believed they were duty-bound to attend. I'll have to roll the dice. How could I reject such a polite invitation? This might be the chance we were waiting for, to make peace with our cousins. Draupadi asked why Yudhishthir didn't think it was odd that Duryodhan had asked in the postscript for them to bring along the deed to Maya Sabha. But Yudhishthir had a possible explanation. Maybe he just wants his lawyers to model other deeds on this one. I did mention in passing sometime that my lawyers write watertight contracts. The others didn't agree. They felt that Yudhishthir was simply eager to gamble and that was the real reason he was ready to roll the dice. But no one said so. It was at about this point that I came into the story. Yes, me, Narad Muni. Bet you didn't expect that, did you? But then again, if you have heard episode 120, maybe you did. Because I told the story of Nala and Damayanti to Yudhishthir to persuade him not to go. But no dice. Yudhishthir didn't listen to me. If he had, the rest of the Mahabharat would probably not have happened. Fast forward to next Tuesday, when the Pandavas arrived in Hastinapur. In the city, there were Ludo-themed banners everywhere. People were even dressed in Ludo-themed costumes and eager to greet Yudhishthir on his visit to Hastinapur. There was a general, holy-like spirit everywhere. Little did people know what was about to happen to the Indraprasth prince whom they knew and loved. The dice were loaded from the start and the Pandavas had walked straight into the lion's mouth. The players assembled in the courtroom that doubled as the Ludo Arena. They were streamers everywhere, announcing the annual Ludo Championships. Dhritarashtra, Bhishma, Dronacharya, Kripacharya, all of the elders were there. And so were the hundred plus Kaurav brothers, as well as Shakuni and Karna. There was a general shaking of hands all around between the Pandavas and the Kauravs, which, given their numbers, came out to over 600 handshakes. That got people a little bit bored. Draupadi opted not to stay. She made her way to the guest rooms and the library. She preferred to curl up with the latest royal gossip magazine instead. And finally, the action got underway. 
it was pandavas versus kauravs duryodhan complained that his hand was a little sore don't you know and that his mama shakuni had graciously agreed to roll the dice on his behalf yudhishthir didn't mind and he even wished duryodhan a speedy recovery yudhishthir rolled the dice and got a 12 calmly he moved his counter forward 12 steps nice way to begin the game he thought shakuni's turn was next duryodhan hoped for a 12 but the dice came up on 2 the crown prince was more than a little miffed what was shakuni doing here he looked sternly at his mama but shakuni remained calm the game went on and it seemed to all be going the pandavas way within 20 minutes the annual ludo championship was over the kauravs had lost duryodhan was more than angry but he couldn't yell at his uncle not in front of the pandavas anyway the grand prize was unveiled a latest model chariot with a giant size key for the insta painters in the press gallery well done nephews shakuni said addressing the pandavas you have a remarkable talent for this game this remark only infuriated duryodhan further shakuni continued but it's early and it will be a shame if you came all the way here for just a short 20 minute game what do you say to the idea of playing some more just for fun let's give the audience a little bit more entertainment truth be told the game was shorter than all the handshakes in the beginning shakuni added that the pandavas had won the world ludo championship fair and square and they would keep that title and the chariot as well this was yudhishthir's cue to say no yes he said enthusiastically as the other four pandavas collectively face palmed yudhishthir was riding a wave of euphoria and confidence in his abilities though this was purely a game of chance it was not a game of chance shakuni had deliberately let yudhishthir win the championship only to bait him into higher stakes hey if yudhishthir won once it meant he could win again couldn't he they started off with a small bet just a thousand gold coins and slowly progressed from there it was not one sided not in the beginning at least shakuni let yudhishthir win enough to keep his hand in the game but before he knew it yudhishthir had wagered not only all his gold and his palace but the entire kingdom of indraprasth yudhishthir should have stopped then but shakuni offered an especially sweet deal if yudhishthir won the next round he would get everything back indraprasth all his gold his chariots horses armies but if he lost he would have to become a slave to duryodhan It wasn't so bad, Shakuni said. Yudhishthir was already homeless. There was little to lose and all to gain. The rest of the court was silent. No one said a word. They were shocked by the state of affairs. But what could they do? Duryodhan was their crown prince, and the emperor Dhritarashtra was not putting a stop to this. Yudhishthir's brothers 
urged him to pull out of the game now. It was bad enough that they were homeless. Again. They would recover somehow. Just leave it here. But Yudhishthir did not leave it there. He felt he owed it to his brothers to try and win it all back. And he knew that he must succeed. Even just purely by probability, the dice was very likely to roll in his favor now. But they didn't. And it didn't end there. Soon, Yudhishthir wagered his four brothers and lost them as well. Duryodhan and Karna and Dushasan laughed out loud. The Pandavas had become slaves to Duryodhan. Dushasan was particularly acerbic towards Bhim. I'm going to make you polish my shoes, he said with a sick kind of excitement. Shakuni seemed more sympathetic to the Pandavas. I feel bad for you, nephews. I want to give you another chance. Let's have one more round. You win, you get everything back. Your freedom, your kingdom, your palace. Everything. And if we lose? asked Yudhishthir in a weak voice, slightly hopeful that Shakuni genuinely wanted to correct the situation. Then Draupadi will be our slave, came Shakuni's reply, with an unmistakably wolf-like grin. If Yudhishthir did not agree, Shakuni was going to point out that as Duryodhan's slave, Yudhishthir could be ordered to wager Draupadi. But it wasn't necessary. Yudhishthir took a deep breath and then he nodded. It was game on. We'll leave it there on a cliffhanger, though the part that follows next is infamous and it's likely many of you already know what will come next. We'll pick up the story again in a future episode. Previous Mahabharat episodes are linked in the show notes and on the site sfipodcast.com. Check them out. I've said this often before and I'll say it again. There are no clear villains and heroes in the Mahabharat. Just a bunch of people who sometimes behave badly and sometimes behave well. Yudhishthir clearly demonstrated a lack of judgment at multiple points in today's story. And many people will pay the price for it, as we shall see later on in the story. In the next episode, we'll go back to the Singhasan Bhattisi. We'll cover yet another story. This time, Vikramaditya solves an important question. What defines a creature? Nature or nurture? Thank you all for the comments on social media and on Spotify's Q&A. Now, with the latest update, I can actually reply to the questions there. So I will directly reply to your comments there. If you have any other comments or suggestions, or if there are particular stories that you'd like to hear, please do let me know by leaving a comment or a review on the site sfipodcast.com or comment on Spotify. You can also find me on Instagram and Facebook. You can listen to the show on all podcast apps, as well as YouTube. If you want to send me an email, it's storiesfromindiapodcast at gmail.com. Be sure to subscribe to the show to get notified automatically of new episodes. A big thank you to each and every one of you for your continued support and your feedback. The music is from purpleplanet.com. That's purple-planet.com. Thank you for listening and I'll see you next time.